There is an important debate underway regarding the future of American energy. It's a debate that demands the full attention of our citizens, an issue of great significance and consequence we can no longer ignore. Polarized by divided allegiances to politics, parties, and popular opinion, many are left wondering who to trust and what to believe. This documentary examines one small but critically important piece of the energy puzzle about a process called hydraulic fracture. God gave us all these resources on this earth, whether it's minerals or plants and animals for us to use. And if we use them in a reasonable, logical, safe way, it's good. My profession and field has been in the environmental sciences, and so I've been cautious of uh, any kind of perturbation to the environment. Any American citizen trying to make a decision about where we should go with this should understand that we have this need for energy in this country, and that, as with any industrial process, it has an effect on the environment, and that that, env that environmental effect can be mitigated to a certain extent, or not mitigated, depending on what kinds of decisions companies make. WPX Energy commissioned this documentary in response to the onslaught of misinformation leveled against their industry as a whole in the process of hydraulic fracture, specifically. But that rig can do six to eight or nine wells from this pad when we come back to it. And it's just... CEO Ralph Hill embraced the idea of an open discussion and willingly provided access to their people, their processes, and even the property owners they work with. We have a gift right now because of, of technology, advances in technology, to be energy independent in this country by a cleaner form of energy. The world runs on energy. And there is not a single aspect of our lives that is not impacted by it. What powers our factories, exploration, travel, and commute depends on. Every advancement made in the way we connect, collaborate, and cure disease requires it. We have an entire nation that is completely dependent upon it. Almost every single thing we use from clothing to computers, contact lenses to CDs is made from it. There is almost nothing that is not touched by our dependence on oil and gas. But drunk on the abundant blessings we glean from it, have we ever stopped to consider what would happen if these things we take for granted all slowly started to disappear? We need a source of energy. And right now, the cleanest source of energy seems to be the natural gas industry. This country needs an all-out, all-of-the-above strategy that develops every available source of American energy. A strategy that's cleaner, cheaper, and full of new jobs. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. And my administration will take every possible action to safely develop this energy. Fred Baldessari is recognized throughout the industry as an expert in gas migration. He has been called upon by industry, landowners, universities, and regulators alike for his ability to trace gas and find its origin. His reputation is based upon finding the truth and presenting the facts, no matter how popular. Natural gas, in my view, and in a lot of experts' view, it, it trumps a lot of other energy sources because it's cleaner, it's abundant, it's in this country. We don't have to rely on other countries. We don't have to, um, you know, worry about a supply because we have this supply here. What dramatically changed everything and made production a viable alternative was combining hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling. Historically, what we used to do is drill a single vertical well at a location, move over, build a brand new pad all over again, use up another three acres of land, and drill another vertical well bore. So perhaps there might be a well every 40 acres. Now what we do is we go to a single pad inside of a 640-acre area, and from that one pad, we drill down, and then we go out horizontally, multiple wells, all on that same three to five-acre pad. So we can put as many as 22 wells in the same space that used to just hold one well. Also, 
every single one of those wells tie back into a central location. So all the production tanks, everything, all the traffic only comes to that one point and everything can be monitored from that one location. That's a pretty big leap when you're reducing your impact that much. Um, and I think sometimes, sometimes people don't realize that it's really becoming that small. The fact is, natural gas production requires a dramatically smaller footprint than conventional drilling and other sources of energy, like solar and wind. America now had the means, the wherewithal, and the resources to become its own best supplier, a way to make itself almost energy independent. But that didn't mean there was clear sailing ahead. There has been a lot of mistruth spoken about the process of hydraulic fracturing and the never-ending supply of people willing to join the chorus or crusade against the evil gas companies. Um, people do not have correct information, and you know, everywhere from the media, you know, just just correct information. The headlines and the um, the sound bites really detract from that experience, and, and folks don't have an opportunity to to really understand fully. To me, every time I see something that's anti our industry, it's just like, wow. You know, typically, that person used something that's powered by energy every single moment of their life. But they can still say, you're poisoning our water, you're causing cancer, you're causing animals to die. I hear that it's causing earthquakes. That's All of that is silliness. They don't have the facts of what's happening when a fracking job is going on. They don't always understand that their home is heated with gas and that that's what we're actually doing. They they perceive us as gas station. You're, you're the one who's making our gas prices so high. It's what you guys are doing. They're not really understanding that it's not that aspect of what we do in the community. I think the biggest misconception is people think we don't care. They don't think we care about the environment or the wildlife or the area or the land. And we do. I don't know what caused them to believe that. And we're all painted with that brush of uh, potentially a bad actor at some point in time. And, and you know, it's, every industry has them. The attacks on them have come from every angle, environmental, political, economical, you name it. Where they have failed, they, like any other industry, should bear the burden and pay the price for their mistakes. When safety and other protocols are ignored, lives are lost, people are harmed, oceans are polluted, and economies are wiped out, they should be held accountable. Every single thing we do, from the very moment we have an idea to go drill somewhere, to when we actually do the drilling, to when we're completing, to when we're actually producing, there are agencies involved regulating every step we do. Like any industry where money and people are involved, there is always the risk of greed and unethical behavior. Those who believe that they could increase profits by cutting corners, meeting minimum requirements, or ignoring safety practices altogether. I think the business model where you maximize short-term profits by cutting corners and ultimately causing damage both to the environment, to your reputation, to the communities in which you work. Long-term, that's not a sustainable model and causes you to go out of business fairly quickly. Um, but when you have one operator that does create a problem like that, the public automatically assumes everybody operates that way. And that's, that's not true at all. But there is nothing responsible, ethical, or intellectually honest about indicting an entire industry for the heirs of a few. Because if you find one person soiling the nest for everyone else, it's going to hurt everyone. And so we report any violations we see, either of our own or of any other operator, to the regulatory uh, people as quickly as possible. So those things can get cleaned up quickly. But those represent a very small percentage of the industry. And nobody works harder to expose them than the industry itself. Profitability, sustained viability, and economic growth are only possible by minimizing errors and maintaining the relationships they have with the community they work in. I think everybody tries to do it right, and the few that don't will, they'll be fine, they'll be put out of business, things will happen to them. The oil and gas industry is, is a fairly small group of operators who not only watch out over their own operations, but also self-police each other. And we also police ourselves very, very carefully. We cannot afford the kind of expensive slip-ups that have occurred in the past, frankly. Communities and residents are all impacted by the development of these sites, by road construction, water use, truck traffic, and other factors. A single site reduces all these impacts on an area where populations live. 
The first part of creating a well is getting to the target source, which in this case is the shale formation. These shale formations are found thousands of feet deep within the earth, often a mile or two below ground. To reach these resources trapped within shale, the energy companies drill vertically, or straight down, to the level of the target source. The greatest damage you could do out here is contaminate the shallow uh, water table from which people are drawing their drinking water and other supplies. And so we take great uh, pains and spend a great deal of expense getting through the first 500 to 1,000 feet of drilling a well. The water from the aquifer that they will have to drill through is tested to establish a baseline. Knowing exactly what the water was like before they started drilling and how it will test throughout the life of the well is critical. What we do is we drill with what's called surface casing because you're trying to protect the surface waters. So we drill a very large hole, 18 inches to 20 inches, all the way down to whatever is required by the particular situation, typically say a thousand feet deep. We set a very large steel casing down that, then we pump cement down the casing, it goes down and then up the back side of the casing and forms a very thick layer of cement between the rocks and the aquifer and the steel casing. Every time we run cement, we'll get a sample at the end of the job. Only after that's set and after we've tested it and run a cement bond lock to confirm that in fact we have a cement bond behind the entire casing string, do we then resume drilling with a slightly smaller bit the rest of the wellbore. These cement bond logs are required and inspected by the state before any further operations or drilling can take place. Depending on the flow rate and the pressures that will be demanded of the well, the gas company may be required to add additional safety layers of steel and concrete. And that's done with the sole purposes of making sure that we can never have communication between the inside of the well bore and that shallow aquifer. There's a lot of misunderstanding about polluting the groundwater. Um, we're not seeing that. that. That's not happening. We have no cases that have been proven. Uh, in the country, as far as I know, where the mechanism of hydraulic fracturing caused a gas migration problem where the gas was, you know, migrated because of the hydraulic fracturing into the aquifer system. Protecting water tables is incredibly important to all energy companies. There's zero profit in doing these wells wrong. It undermines their credibility with a community they want to establish a long-term relationship with. And they know that their integrity and relationships matter. And we've had situations where a homeowner will see a rig nearby, complain that they have a problem with their water well, take a sample, it reveals methane in it, and they said, well, we didn't have it here until we saw that rig move in. People will see a guy lighting his drinking faucet in a video or some guy holding up a jar of dirty water, claiming that some energy company has ruined their lives, and people feel bad for them. Then we go to see and investigate where the rig is, and we find out they haven't drilled 10 inches into the ground. There's no drilling. The energy company had nothing to do with the fact that he could light his water on fire or the fact that the guy had dirty or contaminated water. But those facts never seem to get reported. And all the hyperbole in the media and the misinformation out there and um, you know some of the stuff that, that, that gets put out there is just creating more of this controversy and it's creating, it's, it's almost like scare tactics. However, this aspect of natural gas operations and hydraulic fracturing get more attention and misguided attacks on it than almost any other. Have there been problems with well integrity and with gas migration? Absolutely, there have been. And they, they, they're generally fixed right away and they're generally short term. Um, but there have been a lot of problems that are naturally occurring too that, that are getting you know, the industry is getting tagged with that natural condition being their responsibility, and it's simply not the case. There are a number of areas in the country where organic methane is very close to the surface. It is naturally occurring and has been there or migrating there since the beginning of time. It can make creeks bubble and even leach or migrate into wells or aquifers. But this near-surface gas is different from the deeper, more mature thermogenic gas that energy companies harvest from miles below the surface. EPA and other investigative agencies at the state level have evaluated such occurrences many times to find that this microbial or early thermogenic gas in drinking water has nothing to do with energy companies. The fractures created in these wells are very small and miles below the Earth's surface. While people have inaccurately reported that they can set off earthquakes, the openings that are created in the shell can literally be held open with a few grains of sand. This sand is sent down the well 
and frac float. We pump the sand in and we hope to get two or three grains across such that when it closes, it holds it open about three hundredths of an inch to maybe six hundredths of an inch. That's all we need. It doesn't, you don't need a very big crack for, because it's so tall and it's so long, you get a lot of gas flowing down that crack. And we create lots of them, thousands of them. It's all about surface area in our business. You have to have as much of that super highway going into the formation as possible. You try to break the rock up into smaller pieces as you possibly can within the formation. The critics of hydraulic fracturing cite the enormous amount of water used to fracture a well. This fact is indisputable. Hydraulic fracturing does require a lot of water, and sometimes in areas of the country where everyone is competing for it. We put several million gallons of water down a particular well bore. You start adding that up, and as you come through an area, there will be a large draw on the available water supply in that particular community. To be fair to the energy companies, however, vying for water, the energy company will use on one well about the same amount of water used on a golf course for two weeks. We mitigate that. Typically, once you pump water down the well bore, about 50% of it comes back up to the surface. What we try to do is we reuse it. We use it for the next frack job and the next frack job, and it, it's, obviously it saves us money. And here, as our operations gets bigger, it will recycle 100%. Another concern for those who oppose hydraulic fracturing is the actual chemicals the companies put into or draw back up the well. Those are very carefully regulated. They're very carefully used and applied. They're, we're very conscious of what we do with them once we recover them and bring them back up to the surface. Typically what we do is we simply push them down the next well bore for the next frack job. In some cases, we pull them out and we put them down a deep disposal well where they go into another deep formation where they can't do any harm to anybody. Somewhere between a half a percent and maybe two percent of the total amount of fluid pumped are what we call additives or the chemicals that everyone continues to, to talk about. Well, everything's chemical, but, you know, we have chemical names for everything. Uh, the dishwashing detergent and bleach the same things that are in those two products, household products, are the constituents of this somewhere ranging from about a half a percent to two percent. And it's heavily diluted. The point is that these chemicals used in very small quantities are closely monitored, properly stored, and highly regulated. They are controlled during their application and completely isolated from the fresh water tables by steel and concrete safeguards. We were one of the first companies to push very strongly for full disclosure of frac fluids. Anybody in the public can go out to the fracfocus.org website and look up every single chemical that we have pumped down every single one of our wells over the last few years. And we strongly applaud that. We think it's a good movement in the industry. Everyone should know exactly what's being done on any well on their land. Accidental spills at the surface are quickly mitigated and even guarded against by storage tanks and specially designed spill burns. Additionally, Energy companies are leading the way to find new and better ways of reclamating the same water. They're using deep water sources that can't be used for any other purpose. This is very salty water. In Pennsylvania, early on, operators were taking this very salty water to sewage treatment plants, which simply were not designed to handle that. It was causing a lot of problems. That's why companies have gone to either recycling their, their frac fluid or disposing of it into deep wells. No one is trying to say that hydraulic fracturing is without risk. No form of energy is accident proof. But natural gas in the hydraulic fracturing process has proven itself as safe and as environmentally sound as it comes. WPX has 1,200 employees. The vast majority of those employees live in the areas we operate. Most of those people are out in the field and they live there, they hunt there, they raise their kids there. Their children attend the same schools, attend the same churches, and use the same water sources as their neighbors. That's their way of life, so there's no way, if you just think common sense wise, why would they screw up the place they live? Brad is a WPX employee who has lived in the stretch of Colorado for most of his life, and his family is an active part of the community. We've been here for years, and the people that work here have been here for years, and we try to hire people that are from here and that do drink the same water as the, as the folks that we're drilling on. In fact, that they're our friends, our kids go to school with them. My daughter married some of these kids that have wells on them. And 
It's just we're part of the community here, and I really believe that. We're in it for the long haul here with our integrity and our business ethics and taking care of the property and the wildlife and everything that goes along with development. There's a reciprocal relationship, and we try to bring something of value to them, knowing that uh, we want to be there for years to come. I've been here for like seven years and from the Bronx, and it's a big change. Linda Avilio lives in rural Pennsylvania on a farm she bought to raise her animals. She left New York to purchase a little piece of land she could call her own, find peace, and enjoy life. I love it. This is where I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm not leaving it. It's beautiful. And a little by little building. She does not work for an energy company, nor does she profit from one. Yet her land sets a stone's throw away from a new drill site, where multiple gas wells have been hydraulically stimulated. When Ralph Hill stopped by to see how she was doing, he got a chance to do more than help her feed her alpacas. He had an opportunity to hear her speak about her relationship with his people. It's been more quiet than I thought. And I, as a matter of fact, I had an argument with somebody because they were saying, oh, it's so loud. They're a mile away, and we hear it. And I'm like, I think I'm a half a mile, and I don't hear nothing. And I'm like right on top of it. But it's, it's nothing like all the stories that were going on. Unlike those who live nowhere near her and demonize the energy companies from afar, she sees them as neighbors who care about her, constantly checking in on her and who have her best interest in mind. I haven't had any problems with my water. I haven't had any problems with my pressure water. You know, somebody said, you're gonna lose pressure. And no, still take a good shower. I haven't found a place that I would rather live than right here because it's, it's got everything that I enjoy. It's got clean air and it's got fresh water and good scenery. As a botanist, Ivo Lindauer has watched four generations of family occupy the land he owns in Colorado. We uh, moved to this property in 1936. We had to ride horses to get to school about three miles each way. And mother was a teacher and she says, we've got to get this family closer to bigger schools. And, and so that's when dad bought this ranch. Ivo Lindauer was a scientist who understands the earth below his farm as well. So when the energy companies came calling, he was nobody's fool. Lindauer understood that miles below his land, there was an abundant source of energy that could be tapped into efficiently, safely, and unobtrusively. When he was offered a significant amount of money to sell his land, he didn't. Uh, we turned down their offer, which would have made us all financially independent for the rest of our lives. Our family is living here, and uh, all of the things I grew up with, like being able to hunt out the back door, wide open spaces where you can go and do what you want to do. Uh, those are the things that convinced me that, uh, uh, that we should keep this property for the family so that they can grow up and have some of the privileges that I had. I think it's been good for everybody, although we're all having to work hard now, but <laughs> that's what life's about, work. If you don't have work, you know, you don't have much, you know. He wasn't willing to sell his land, but he wasn't willing to endanger his family or his grandchildren either. Teaming with a responsible energy partner, he knew that natural gas could be extracted safely and provide benefit to all. WPX has been very easy to work with. We've uh, had a lot of dealings with them, cooperation with them, and uh, uh, in all instances, from my standpoint, it's been excellent. It is estimated that 2.8 million jobs have been created directly or indirectly by the gas industry in the last 10 years. Like others in controversial industries, bad news and bad press travels around the world in lightning speed, but the truth that follows tends to take forever. We are a nation of people never complacent with sitting on yesterday's successes who lead the world in technological discovery. Unharnessing the chains that prevent us from unlocking the vast resources below us is essential to that end. 
It must come with open and honest discourse. It must come with safety and environmental impact in mind. But it must come. The viability of our economy, jobs, and national security ultimately depend on our ability to become self-sufficient. We must end division, encourage innovation, and inspire generations to come. Energy independence could not hold bigger stakes for our economy, our security, and our future.